Hey, what's going on, guys? Come back again here. In this video, I'm going to share my experience on what I've learned by creating for more than 100 real estate property scrapers uh, as a Python developer specializing in web scraping, actually. And all those jobs were done for the only single client, uh, which is which says which means something, I believe. So just to give you an idea of, of amount of work being done first, so these are the, the folders for all the sites I've been scraping and if we have a look at this kind of every single folder it has really lots of uh, scrapers inside so we're, I was scraping commercial sale, rent, residential rate, uh, sale, rent sometimes the houses are separated uh, ha like houses, flats and so on so just to give you an idea of the amount of work being done and after you know like uh, Doing all that job, uh, uh, I've been improving my my techniques and skills on how in particular to actually uh, deal with this uh, with this stuff. And at this moment, I think that uh, I'm already capable of sharing some sort of a highlights, uh, some uh, uh, some sort of a highlights to emphasize the uh, the most important parts in this sort of in, in this sort uh, of an experience uh, I get. Uh, from working on that project. So, uh, without further ado, let's actually start. So, this would be the talk for uh, the talk format, and uh, as you can see here, I've drafted some uh, topics to talk about. I'm not. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to keep this as short as possible. But you know, like uh, usually when I'm trying to do this, it's about a one-hour video. But I really hope this one would be a little bit shorter. Uh, so, and anyway, uh, I hope this would be quite pretty interesting and resourceful for those of you guys who actually does web scraping professionally and if some of you have been doing uh, some a real estate property scraping that might be even more interesting for you guys and on the other hand uh, this video would be containing some general tips on web scraping like uh, from the freelancers point of view so without further ado let's actually start so uh, the very first thing I'd like to talk about is picking up the proper clients type right over in here. So uh, what I've learned uh, as a freelancer that there are for about four types of clients. So those that are using the data for, the, for their personal use, and this is the smallest uh, part uh, of the clients that uh, I've been working with personally. Uh, then uh, there is a slightly uh, greater part uh, who are the real estate property agents. Well, uh, as far as I'm uh, talking from the, from the perspective of the real estate property site, this uh, obviously the client types regards to the real estate properties, obviously. Uh, then uh, slightly, uh, well, about equal to the real estate ag uh, agents, uh, about equal category, uh, at least in my experience, is the property investors. So property investors are those rich guys who has really lots of money. They don't know where to invest them, and then eventually starting to buy some properties in I don't know in Dubai and renting their rooms and making great income on that. So th those guys are known as property investors. And finally, uh, data scientists. And you know, like. Uh, even though I've been working uh, with only data scientists and uh, I really made uh, some uh, really satisfying uh, income from working with that client. Uh, and even though I had the only data scientist to work with, still I believe that uh, exactly working for the data scientists is the best ever opportunity available to, to a given freelancer because uh, first, uh, data scientists are also programmers, so they understand your concerns and it's far easier to talk to someone, a guy who actually knows how to code because you're kind of like one team, while uh, for all the other type of clients it's more like uh, he, he doesn't understand and doesn't care about tiny little technical details you're uh, fa facing some trouble troubles with. So that's another uh, benefit of working with a data scientist. And uh, what is the most interesting uh, in working with a data scientist is that they usually, uh, actually, you don't really not, uh, you don't really need to interact with the client uh, because data scientist is interacting with the client, which is really good. And uh, like just to give you uh, an overall understanding of what in particular they are doing, actually. So it's all about uh making some statistics uh basing on the prices of the properties like uh 
the regions, I mean, like you, uh, most likely they are using the coordinates like latitude and longitude to uh, compare the prices, uh, say, dependent, the dependency of the prices on the coordinates. So that's one of the core statistics available. And also uh, features like uh, what exactly is, is available within the current given property, like uh, building fabric, uh, some amenities. I don't know, uh, maybe some key features like how many bathrooms, bedrooms, and so on. So all this, uh, all this stuff uh, affects the end price. And also, if you will then try to compare uh, the real estate properties, like they are for sale or, or are uh, at the moment are for sale or for rent, and with those that are already sold or just getting rented already, then you can see the difference. So I mean, like the price for the real estate property that is about to be sold might be a bit higher than the one that is sold say in the same house or in the same region or the same type of property so there there i just, I just uh i'm not an expert in this at any point uh, i just want to give you an idea that uh, all these tiny little details you're scraping about real estate properties are extremely important for data scientists and uh it's hard to over evaluate uh how, how the importance uh, of this data to the data scientists and uh, they really uh, they build in the models that uh, bring in the actual income to their clients and that's why this is so popular nowadays and at the same time as I've been mentioning in some of my previous videos so uh, data scientists are not often good at web scraping themselves because the mindset you need to have to actually build all those data models is quite a bit different compared to the engineers mindset where, uh, that you're using while you're making some web scraping so you're just uh, it's kind of like uh, technical skills and, and some techniques uh, and uh, solving particular tasks versus build, build, building castles in the skies because uh, you know like you can't just pick up a given pattern to create a model to predict I don't know like say prices for real estate properties it seems to be easy and simple and there are really, really lots of tutorials but the difference between those data scientists who actually make big money on this and those who just trying to to make something is very significant. So it's not about just trying to pick up some sort of a tutorial on the internet and apply this and uh, and get rich out of that. So that, that, that's not the case, obviously. So in order to create uh, a really reasonable and decent model, uh, you really need to uh, a specific mindset for that. And that's, by the way, the reason why I'm still delaying my machine learning tutorials, because again, like, uh, without understanding the data, without uh, obtaining that, I'm, I'm not saying about uh, obtaining that sort of a mindset. It's it probably I needed to to born as another person, uh, but still, it takes time to get into that mindset because uh, with the engineers' mindset, it's incredibly hard to make this machine learning stuff. But anyway, uh, these four types of clients are those that I've been working with, and again, like. Uh, it's not about how many clients you had, it's about how many work you've done for a current given client. And uh, I'm measuring not uh, regarding the number of clients, but regarding the amount of work that has been done. So uh, I've done just a few uh, uh, real estate scrapers for personal use, uh, a bit more for agents, slightly bit more for investors, and uh, really lots of, lots of stuff for uh, for the data scientists, but for the only guy I'm now working with. So that's that's kind of the idea. And by doing this, uh, uh, all these uh, projects, uh, uh, obviously I've been encountering uh, numerous issues because, you know, like sites, like real estate property sites, most likely they don't welcome you to scrape their data because there are smart people there and they understand that if you just scrape this for free, you can make big use of it and really make lots of money on that. So they're trying to restrict these opportunities either by trying to sell some APIs to those interested or just uh, disallowing to use the data for some other reasons. So that's uh, probably the, one of the most uh, important restrictions to deal with and to take care about when you're trying to scrape really massive amounts of data uh, in regards to real estate property sites. So the next section I'd like to talk about would be uh, about the dealing with the anti-scraping measures. So um, like uh, if we talk about the well-known techniques that everybody use, 
uh, it's the header spoofing. So, uh, for example, uh, if you say if you take the headers that are uh, being passed along with your HTTP request when you're making the request to the target website, say if you don't specify the user agent and uh, and using scrapey framework that the target site would see like okay, so somebody's trying to scrape my site using scrapey so that's the automated bot and that should be blocked and that's it and you can get anything so that's the most primitive anti-scraping measure uh, obviously but still uh, it's quite pretty effective uh, for those who are trying to scrape data for the very first time at least so I'm not sure why they still using this but well that's that's the fact so some sites really need to specify a, a current user agent and it also spreads not only to the user agent but for for the uh, other uh, the other headers as well. Uh, it's it's been diff it's different from from one site to another. Well, some sites uh, uh, need to make sure that the referer uh, header is uh, is set properly, and uh, some sites has some specific headers that are not standard. And if you don't specify their values, you're getting blocked. So that's another idea. But uh, from the technical perspective, it's not really that big deal to. Uh, actually, uh, handle this uh, uh, to handle these headers because you just uh, create an a dictionary. If you're talking, if we're, if we're talking about the Python, and just pass in this uh, headers along with a HTTP request, and that's it. Actually, this is ha this is happening regardless of the library, so it works with the request request library and the, with the scrape as well. So it doesn't really matter that much which one to pick here, and. A bit more complicated any scraping measure that is being involved on uh, really less number of sites is the handle of cookies. So you know that cookies are uh, uh, some sort of a data that, uh, like, <laughs> it's designed to uh, make users experience better on the current given site. So let's say you've been searching for some specific type of the properties on their site, and uh, your browser has uh, stored uh, some data regarding what kind of uh, properties in what region you've been uh, crawling through and if you go to this site the next time uh, and let's say the site has some new uh, advertisements available it would give you those uh, in featured list uh, it would give you those that uh, correlates with the particular uh, searches that you've been doing uh, in previous but that's only from the users uh, users perspective but when it comes for uh, automated website crawlings it's getting a little bit more complicated and uh, unfortunate to be honest uh, because one of uh, well there are uh, basically there are two kind of cookies so the first time uh, are those that live forever and these are the, the good cookies because you can just specify them once and you don't really need to care about the so-called uh, timeout of the cookies but uh, in other cookies uh, are designed so they expire uh, at a specific uh, time or date and that means that you would have been you, you would need to update them uh, from time to time so you can do that either automatically or uh, uh, just uh, either or automatically uh, via, uh, uh, via actually extracting the cookies from the response every time and updating your, uh, your 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 cookies so the next request would already be using the updated cookies or uh, also, it's possible just if they're not uh, being updated that quickly, well, let's say they're updated like, say, once a day or once a week, then you can just manually update them and then just run your crawler. And, and when it, the cookies are exhausted, you just use another bunch, uh, you, you, you use just another bucket of cookies and then you just run a script again and so on and so on. But obviously, it's not really good from the client's perspective, like as a user, because uh, it's not really that uh, easy for them to 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 do that. So automating stuff is always better. Uh, another uh, two couple of uh, I don't really want to call them anti scraping measures, but uh, I would try and uh, I would call them the measures that are making the uh, developers' life harder. <laughs> I mean, the developer who's trying to scrape their, the, those sites. So these two are complicated crawling and complicated data extraction. So uh, when you just navigate to whatever website, uh, uh, it seems like, for, like from the user perspective, uh, surfing uh, in the browser, uh, you just click the links and just navigate into another pages, regions, like links, whatever. 
But when you're starting uh, to mimic this behavior from within a Python script, uh, it often turns out that uh, either uh, the links for the regions are not available, so let's say they might be uh, getting fetched from the API, and that's not a big deal, but if that API is protected by, uh, again, it, it can be protected by cookies themselves, by the way, it can be, uh, uh, it can be protected by uh, auth uh, auth authentication tokens uh, that quite often being, uh, are being extremely difficult to uh, obtain, so that's kind of really pain there. So, uh, uh, well, really lots of, <laughs> really lots of disasters are available. I don't even uh, enumerate them uh, just straight out of my head, but I've just been facing really lots of sites that like, okay, you try to scrape me, uh, I don't mind, but uh, you, <laughs> you will just break your brain. Uh, in order to understand how exactly to provide the proper crawling logic, so in order to to crawl through the entire site. And on the other hand, the data extraction uh, complications might be arising, so uh, like uh, it's, it's really handy when every single data entry that you need to scrape has its own either CSS class or identifier uh, or uh, some error label or whatever attribute uh, that is available in within the HTML tag that can make this particular uh, DOM element unique. So if this is unique, it's incredibly easy to scrape, but these uh, often do uh, a disaster like uh, that they're, they're making just literally absolutely the same elements and they don't have any unique, uh, they don't have any unique uh, attributes and it's almost like parsing the raw text basically so in these cases uh, you can easily obtain the response but, but in order to actually get the data uh, being structured which is incredibly important for web scraping purposes uh, it all it also takes hours just to deal with those responses to just just try to mm, separate uh, the sections and try to provide a reasonable data set in return so that's another thing. Uh, and now the, these last two are the most uh, weird <laughs> uh, for, well, for me personally, it's the captures. So if you don't know what the capture is, it's mm, a very smart system on the target website that uh, it's, using the machine, it's using machine learning in order to distinguish between the human users and bots like scrape spiders. And uh, there, there's really complicated logic behind that. And how it works is the following, they just uh, don't allow you to, uh, they, let, let's say you've crawled through 100 pages and then he says like, okay, so I think that you're not a human, I think you're a Python script. So in order to prove the opposite, please uh, submit this capture. And uh, captures are uh, usually done as the visual elements that uh, it needs some JavaScript based in browser user interaction. Let's say like click on a checkbox or pick up some uh, bus images from <laughs> from the list of images containing not, not only buses, but some planes or uh, air airplanes or uh, trains or things like that and so on, which <laughs> are not easy to solve even being as a human, <laughs> to be honest, well, for me personally at least. So, uh, uh, that's that's kind of weird and the way how I deal with captures uh, well actually so, some people some developers prefer to actually try to solve them uh, but what but but what I but what I found is the more you're trying to solve the captures the more complicated captures you're starting encountering uh, further on uh, when you're crawling the website so like there are uh, up to three level at least of captures like uh, the simple captures like intermediate captures and advanced captures and now they've uh, created even so-called invisible captures uh, that's absolute pain like so you, you don't even see that uh, capture if you're a user but if you're crawling and if you're trying trying to automate the capture solving from within, from within from within a script it turns out that your script actually uh, Th considers the hidden capture to be a real capture and trying to solve it and that's and here he, it's getting captured <laughs> so <laughs> captcha says like okay so you're not a human because human won't ever see this but you're trying to solve me that means that you're a bot and you're done you're not going anymore a anywhere else so 
that's another disaster basically uh, and uh, but captures uh, are actually well in most cases they can be bypassed using the paid proxies so it's already a pain because you need to ask your client to pay for additional service not only the job you've done but also try to pay so for, for some sort of a paid proxies uh, uh, which gives you an automated uh, uh, opportunity to make every uh, next HTTP request from the new IP address and that's the reason when you simply don't hit the limit of say 100 pages being crawled from a single IP address so the target site thinks that uh, you're Mm, uh, that it's not the only script that actually capture uh, that it's not the only script that crawling through all the site but it's like uh, many different people are simultaneously uh, navigating through the site but uh, if this was so easy that the life would be pro would probably be better but unfortunately there are monsters in anti-scraping business and one of the most well known is distill networks probably the most successful company on this market so what they do uh, you know like it's probably their, their know-how and they probably it's <laughs> uh, not probably definitely it's uh, no nobody knows how exactly that works uh, I think though well probably some complicated machine learning should be used uh, in order to distinguish between this like user user human users and uh, automated bots not sure how exactly they work but the idea is that uh, if the site is protected well say by the distal networks company uh, that what happens that even if you're using uh, paid proxies to bypass the captures it still uh, recognize you as a bot because it just understands okay so the site is being crawled from different places but what, let's say there is some sort of a logic in that crawl and then if it finds the logic it can uh, it assumes that uh, actually you are uh, a bot and then there is no way to bypass those captures and uh, they are really good at that and what I can say professionally that I simply don't scrape sites that, that are protect, protected by captures and mm, uh, you might wonder why well that's because that's point uh, that's totally pointless because you just uh, if you if you spend time for writing a scraper and if and if and even if your scraper will scrape some data uh, you won't get paid uh, properly because uh, actually developers who are doing web scrapers are not really paid, getting paid for their code but for the amount of data being scraped by, by their scrapers so in case if you're still hitting some captures uh, you just won't uh, scrape a reasonable a decent amount of data but instead just a few uh, entries and that's it so your work doesn't doesn't work that's it so not, uh, so that's the reason why I never uh, at least recently I never take the jobs if any captures are there so it's I, I always uh, uh, explain new clients that actually if you have uh, uh, if you're trying to scrape this site with the captures so you just don't do this and that's it or just run someone else who, who would be suffering trying to bypass that because you know like when you're trying to bypass the security measures uh, uh, created by the big companies you just imagine the power of brains of all those developers that everyone is probably smarter than you and if there are re really lots of developers working on, the, on, a, on a single issue that <laughs> their brain power is greater than yours obviously so you can't compete with you know like 20 plus developers that are smarter than you and trying to make everything so you won't be able to scrape that data so that's that's the reason why I just escaped that just not even trying to compete with those guys and uh, corporate logically uh, we're coming to the very last part so which sites to scrape and which not so it's quite pretty uh, logical uh, and basically for this talk and here I want to uh, here I want to share some thoughts as well so uh, according to my current experience with my data scientist client uh, once I told him you know, like uh, instead of trying to scrape uh, fancy sites that have really lots of data let's better go and scrape some less known uh, some less known sites that are just growing and they're not really well known and they actually welcome search engines to index them and that means that they are not trying to forbid uh, to extra to crawl through them and respectfully to extract data from them 
and that might be the case so it's better to scrape three four sites uh, in a given country uh, that are less well known rather than try to scrape one very well known uh, site because the overall number of unique advertisements you would have find uh, would actually be much greater if you scrape like from two three four sites on a, of, a, of a given country instead of trying to scrape the one uh, fancy website even though well let's say the fancy website has I don't know like two hundred thousands of advertisements overall and let's say that some less well-known sites has for about like 60 60 thousands of uh, uh, of this uh, overall number of advertisements well actually it's it's it's, uh, it's actually greater than uh, than that but any anyway so let's say six uh, sixty hundreds one sixty hundreds two it's already one hundred and twenty thousands and if we just make a couple more it would be two hundred and forty thousand so it's more and in this little sites uh, uh well, less well-known sites you make sure that you actually do scrape all the data and you will have well maybe not 20 to 200 thousands but at least you will have like 150 thousands of entries been scraped and that's not bad at all while you will try to scrape that fancy website you will most likely scrape for about 20 thousands and then you just get in bent and that's it you're not going anywhere so that's my uh, strategy of uh, scraping real estate property sites. I'm just trying to pick up, uh, 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 I'm telling my client to try to pick some less well-known sites and actually um, uh, try to scrape them. So it's better just to make more scrapers and that would give more data and it would be done easily. And uh, regarding the pricings, uh, uh, I just started giving uh, a 50% stake-offs. So let's say uh, when I just started, I was making one scraper, uh, well, a scraper for the, let's say one project, so no, no, matter how, no matter how many scrapers, it might be four or six scrapers per project. So one project was costing like $200, but they were not always working and sometimes it needed weeks, uh, uh, it, it, like for about a week was needed to find out that is what, it, wasn't actually working but the money was already paid and that's a little bit not really that great scenario for a client at least and uh i was feeling like i'm guilty and well i, I couldn't give the money back because I, i've already spent this money uh, i couldn't uh, refund my client uh and when when this started happening too often uh, i realized that i need to change my strategy and what i advised him i said like okay so I just would be making scrapers like not uh, not scrapers i would be making the project not 200 dollars but only 100 dollars per project but we would be scraping we would be making really more uh, scrapers and the amount of data uh, would be greater and they all would be stable and that's the exact uh, pattern uh, we're following now and it works like a charm so from my income perspective it's about equal to what I've been uh, to, to what I had before uh, from the amount of work perspective uh, I say that now I'm making well I'm making more work that I was doing before but at the same time you know like uh, when you're making doing some work and it works <laughs> it's much better than if you're doing some work making efforts and uh, eventually it doesn't work so I think this this is quite pretty uh, fair trade-off and I think this is just quite pretty nice. So the very first category sites that welcome being scraped, and these are the sites that are kind of relatively new. So let's say it didn't appear like six years ago or 10 years ago, it just appears, it appeared, well, let's say a year ago, half a year ago, so it's quite pretty young. And it's not really well known by the customers, so it's trying to get indexed by as many search engines as possible to be to become well known one day and probably later on well they just make some money they would buy some digital networks protection and you won't be able to scrape them later on but anyway new new sites are appearing uh, 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 every time so uh, they always appear and um, it's really uh, uh, the services of data hopefully would never be exhausted okay so um, Another type of sites, as, as I was already been mentioned, like those that are restricted by the user agents. Uh, and again, like, so th this is a little bit of duplication, but uh, 
Mm, I just, uh, so w when I was talking about the end scraping measures, uh, I was talking from, from the perspective of how to bypass these anti scraping measures and in this size like which size to scrape and which, and which are not it's more likely for mm, performing some initial tests and this is this is what i'm talking about here uh so just trying to make some tests uh to answer the simple question whether the current given site is worse of uh, being scraped or not and now that's the by default uh option for me so before actually start working on a web scraping project first uh, I'm performing this test so the very first thing uh, I'm trying to do so if uh, so to to figure out if if the site welcomes welcome being scraped I'm just opening the scrapey shell and making an HTTP get request to a particular URL endpoint uh, where the properties are listed and if it just gives me the 200 response, and if at the same time it's not a capture, if it's not uh, some weird stuff, if I really see the data right, right over in there or, or the links, and I can crawl through the links, that means that the site is welcoming you being scraped. Oh, obviously, don't forget to check the robots.txt file, which uh, explicitly uh, either forbids or allows you to scrape some particular, uh, some particular uh, URLs basically, and also it quite often it uh, provides uh, the crawl and speed delay. Like, let's say you can you're allowed to make uh, one request r request per second or one request per two, three, five seconds, and so on, which uh, you really need to take care of to, to to take care about because it's really important. And well, actually, if I see this like site, then uh, I am uh, continuing my test. But if I see that it's not really that it, it, it gives me some weird response like for 405 let's say uh, the most likely to have the response to have in case of captures of some restrictions in that case well I can actually uh, try to spoof the user agent and to see if it still works and sometimes it's enough so you just spoof the user sorry guys if you just spoof the user agent uh, and you see like it kind of works and then you then, then I continue my tests if not, I just drop that site immediately because uh, it's not worth of my time to be taken to trying to be past those anti-scraping measures. I would better uh, I would better just take another site and that's it. And uh, well, sometimes uh, it's quite really less cases, but well, sometimes uh, I'm trying to use the cookies, and sometimes it helps. Uh, not often, but sometimes it helps. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so let, let's better uh, take the the case where actually site is welcome you to being scraped. So the next, so what I mean by saying crawling test uh, and check for appropriate data. So by crawling tests, I mean I need to figure out whether I can navigate uh, uh, through the site by following the links recursively because there are often uh, multiple levels. Like if this is a real state property site, so just like uh, region, like subregions, cities, or postal codes or whatever. Uh, patterns they use there uh, so I'm just trying to crawl through uh, all of them to, to make sure that they are crawlable actually that I can extract the links every time I need that and if I can the very last task to make is check for the appropriate data and uh, in particular regarding uh, real, real estate properties uh, well actually the appropriate data is defined uh, whether the data is uh, is appropriate or not is defined by the client because he like visually has a, uh, has a look uh, at at the data and if if it considers that data to, data to be decent he just tell me okay let's just please scrape this site that's it but uh one of his uh, uh one of his requests is always to it's uh, is always to scrape coordinates like latitude and longitude this means that if there are no coordinates that no matter how decent the data is without those coordinates uh this data doesn't make any sense to his machine learning pur uh, purposes so the idea is simply uh, for me basically the idea is just to check whether uh, uh, whether the current given site is actually uh, allows you to extract the latitude and longitude coordinates from the property listings or not and if it is then I say like okay so I'm just starting making a new scraper and that's it and in most cases it works and if it's not, I say just, well, everything good, but I can't really extract the latitude and longitude, so it's not, this side is not an option. That's, that's kind of it. Okay, guys, so this is basically, 
all I wanted to tell you about my experience on uh, this real estate property scrapers. So just to summarize it a little bit. So just scrape those sites that are easy to scrape and do it more. And don't waste your time by trying to bypass uh, some anti-scraping measures created by big teams of guys that are much smarter than you are. That's it. So, uh, I don't know whether this uh, information might be useful for you, but uh, I just felt like I really need to share it with you guys because, again, like when, when you're doing something for, for a long time, uh, it starts getting more clear regarding the key points in the entire process of, of what you're doing. Okay, guys, so this is it from my side. Uh, Machine learning tutorials are about to come soon, well at least I hope so, but I still really need lots of preparations. And I really hope that that would be really interesting. So this is it from my side, see you next time. Uh, until that, and take care.